Acts chapter 7 uh, and verse 9. Acts chapter 7 uh, and verse 9. Amen. Acts chapter 7 and verse 9. Why don't you clap your hands uh, as you are blessing him. God bless you. Amen. <laughs> clap your hands as you are praising him and glorifying him. From the New King James Version, the Word of God says, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now a famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our fathers found no sustenance. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. The subject for this hour is we reproduce what we talk about. We reproduce what we talk about. And we really believe that because if you just keep talking about a thing and talking about it, you'll end up doing the thing that you talk about most. You keep meditating over a thing, sharing it with your friends, and talking about it, you'll end up trying to do. Uh, for example, if you keep talking about robbing a bank and just keep talking about it, and you talk about it to the right people, and they'll come in agreement with you. And they'll convince you that you can do it and get away with it. And before you know it, you, I see your picture, amen, on the evening news. Amen. I want to encourage you to talk about things that are positive. And when people, when you find yourself in a negative conversation, you can dismiss yourself from that conversation. You can easily leave. You, can, you don't have to hurt anyone's feeling. You can just say that something just came up. I got to go. I got some other business I got to take care of. I just, can't, I just can't get involved in this conversation. Now, uh, you know, most of us want to be good conversationers. We want to have good conversations with people. When we meet strangers, we want to have something to talk about. And we want to ask them, what kind of day are you having? These are some of the questions that we ask. We ask them, have you ever traveled to a foreign country? We ask these kind of questions. Do you play any sports? Are you a musician? What are you passionate about? What is your favorite pastime? How many children you got? You been married? Are you married now, single? You know, all these kind of questions are questions that we ask just to make conversation with people. But rarely do we ask people, are they saved? We very rarely ask a person, we feel uncomfortable sometimes asking people, we look at them and, 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 and we make decisions about whether they are saved or not, but we very rarely ask them a point blank question. Are you saved? Do you trust the Lord and Savior? Do you love him? Do you believe that he has favor that he can apply over your life? Do you believe that the favor of God is beneficial for your situation? Uh, do we ask people questions like that? No, because it makes people feel uncomfortable. And you know, everybody don't like to, you know, everybody don't do that. Everybody don't believe in God, you know. And so we don't want to get, uh, we, want, we don't want to hurt anyone. Feel, we don't want anybody to hurt our feelings. So therefore, we just stay with safe topics, safe subjects. But I want you to know that, that God uh, himself was not bashful. He's not bashful about favor. He's not bashful about letting the world know that he has favor and he makes it available to us. 
uh, favor can also travel as grace. Grace is what? Defined unmerited favor. It's favor that you don't even deserve, unmerited. You don't work for it. You, you can't qualify for it. All you have to do is trust God for it. Amen. And, and, and God is not bashful about letting us know that he has favor. He's not bashful about letting us know that his favor is available to us. He talks about it greater than 114 times in the Bible. So he can't be bashful about it. Amen. Favor. So he just keeps talking about it. And, and, uh, and, and he says that favor, he, he says that we are made in his image and in his likeness. This is God talking. We are made in his image and in his likeness. In other words, if you take a picture of God and place us alongside it, we should have some striking similarities to what God looks like. So if you got any, any, any conceived notions, if you have any idea about what God ought to look like, just begin looking at yourself. Huh? Just, and I know you don't want to get too high into this thing. You don't want to take this thing too far. But God said this in his own word. He says, I made you in my likeness, like which means that I made you like me, and I made you in my image. So the imagery should be virtually the same. Now, I know you don't want to give God praise now, amen, because you know that, that you, you're probably not the image that you started out with, but you still made in God's likeness. Amen, amen, and so you, because, listen to me, because you are made in God's likeness and in his image, you shouldn't let people handle you any kind of way. Amen, amen, don't walk up on me, amen, any kind of way. Amen, don't try to condescend to me because I'm made in what? I'm made in God's likeness and in his image. Amen, it's, it's okay for your eyes to be bloodshot and you... Uh, amen, for your veins to pop out in your neck, but I want you to know that I'm made in God's likeness. Amen, and I'm made in God's image. So whatever you're thinking about me, amen, you're also thinking about the one who made me in his likeness and in his image. And, and so when, listen to me, if you are made in God's likeness and in God's image, every. Once in a while, you ought to say some of the stuff that God is saying. Huh? Every once in a while, you ought to do some of the things that God will do. Amen? Some of the time, some of the, you ought to let somebody catch you asking people, are they saved? Are they saved? I heard a joke last night. Uh, I just happened to watch this uh, White House deal they had last night. White House commentators, they had a thing where the president was there. And I love this one joke, and I hope you don't mind if I try to tell it. The man, <laughs> I'm not much of a jokester, as you can see. But in any case, um, Trevor Noah was telling the joke about Mitch McConnell. And he said that Mitch McConnell uh, was being interviewed by another gentleman. And the other gentleman said, hey, Mitch, he said, uh, he said, why is it that you and the devil have never been seen together in the same place? <laughs> I thought that was pretty funny. But I'm not talking about Republicans. I'm not talking about Democrats. But I thought it was real funny that he asked Mitch, why well, no one <laughs> has never seen him in the same place with the devil? And, and Mitch had a response. You know, Mitch has a response. He said, well, whoa, 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 whoa. He, said, he said, why don't you go to hell and find out? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that everybody ought to have a little humor every once in a while. Even God himself has humor. I think he had a little humor when he made me. Amen. <laughs> Glory to God. I'm not absolutely certain that he put his best foot forward, but he did what, and I'm giving him praise and glory for what he did. 
<laughs> Amen. So listen at the word. Doubt and unbelief does not come out of God's mouth. God is not going around talking about, I don't know whether they're going to repossess my kingdom or not. I don't know whether I can make a payment. I don't know if I can pay the interest on the glory. You know, God is not, God is not looking at his phone when his phone rings and decide whether he's going to answer it or not. Y'all didn't get that one. God is not telling his children, tell them I'm not home. Amen. When the doorbell ring, he will answer the door. Why? Because he doesn't operate in doubt, fear, or unbelief. Let me define favor for you. And, and it's, available, it's available to all of us. Favor, God's favor or grace, is God giving us the ability to do something which is humanly impossible for us to do. That is grace. And God has given that to us. And so again, I want you to get it into your spirit that God has equipped you and I to do things that are humanly impossible to do. Do I need to stop for a moment and give you an example of that? Amen. This building that we're sitting in right now was humanly and factually impossible for us to do at the time that we were trying to do it. Amen. It was impossible because we didn't, we didn't have the numbers, nor did we have the money to do it. It was I never will forget, and my wife will remember the night that, that we sit in a truck outside with the builder that was going to build the, uh, build the building. He was going to be our general contractor. And he told us, he gave us a figure, an astronomical amount of money. And, and we, 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 look, we didn't have no idea that we were going to be talking about that kind of money, right? We looked at each other and said, we, there ain't no way we're coming up with that kind of money. It, we, there's no point in even talking further about this because we not we don't have this money and we don't have access to this kind of money. Well, guess what happened, though? He, even a person who wasn't on our side, I'll say that this person wasn't 100% on our side, but here's what he told us. He said, well, you don't have to do it all at once. You can do it in phases. And so he gave us, although he really wasn't for us, I don't believe, but he gave us an idea. God used him to give us an idea on how we could get it done. You see what I'm saying? And that's how God works. He will, he will, if something seemed impossible to you, Tony, he will give you a way, he will give you a system, he will give you a strategy that you can use to accomplish something that virtually is impossible. And I'll tell you that we started this ministry with 15 people. We had, had a few more than that at the time, but we needed, I believe he was asking uh, something like $900,000. We weren't coming up with that kind of money to build this building. Are you still with me? But he gave us a way in which we could get it done. You see what I'm saying? So I want you to know whatever you are up against, whatever you're facing, whether it's a personal thing, whether it's a health thing, I want you to know that God already has figured out a way where you can get that thing done. Amen. And, and, and because he has given you sufficient quantities of grace and mercy, then all you have to do is just position yourself so that you can receive the blessing that God has already made available for you. How many of you know you already have the blessings? The blessings are already sitting at your door. The blessings are already in front of your face. All you got to do is apply yourself and it'll come to pass. God's favor is us doing something that is humanly impossible for us to do. There ain't no way we could get it done, but God makes it happen. And we're standing here right now to prove, glory to God, that it's, now, don't get me wrong, I would love to have 350 people sitting in here right now. 
But I want you to know that I give God praise and give him glory for the ones who are sitting here. Because what I know is that God has placed the ones that he wanted to be here at this time. They are here right now. The ones that he wanted to be here and the ones that this message is applicable for, they are sitting right here, right now in this place. Glory to God. And I want you to know those people who are online, there are people who are blessing this ministry who we have never seen. Why? Because God made it possible. He is making it. Remember what the word says, uh, the definition for grace is, is God giving us the ability to do something. God is giving us the ability to minister to people that we've never seen, never met. And they are blessing us. We've never seen them, never met. I just, if I could just tell you one more story. The people who finance this project, a part of it, this building, we have never seen them, never met them, never saw them. They have never even seen, to my knowledge, maybe they have saw it on, on, uh, on the internet or wherever. They have never seen an image of us, to my knowledge. Amen. But they trusted us because we said that we trust God. We said we trust God. They said because you trust God, we trust you. Are you still with me? God will make it possible to do things that are humanly impossible. Oh, bless the name of Jesus. God is working some stuff out right now that you have given up on. But I want you to rekindle, I want you to rekindle your desire to do that thing that you really want to do. Whether it's a business, whether it's a, I don't know what it is, but you know what it is. And God is making that thing available to you right this very minute. Why? Because grace applies to your situation and works out circumstances that you're not able to physically do. For example, you cannot accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior without having faith. And when you have faith in him, then he immediately applies grace to your case. When you have faith. So you got to have faith. Now it, takes, it does take something to get God moving. What is it? Faith. That's what it takes. And when you exercise Remember, faith is like a body, so to speak. It has to be exercised. Glory to God. It has to be put to I mean, if you never exercise your faith, then it does not benefit you. It does not work for you. But if you will exercise it, if you will say, Lord, I'm going to believe you for this today. But tomorrow, i got a plan to, to believe you for something else. Let me give you an example. Right now, we're believing God for this building. But in the future, we're believing God for a building greater than, listen, listen at what I say, greater than 10,000 square feet. We are believing God for that. Are you believing with me? I, I certainly hope that you can believe. Look, well, you might ask, well, you might ask, um, well, why do you need such a big building? But we don't have that many people. But we're making, the preacher preached this morning about making preparation. I'm making preparation for what God is able to do. Not what I'm able to do. I know God is able to do things that I am physically unable to do. So then, so then God lets me know that, look, you need to make preparation so that you can handle a larger capacity of people. Guess what? We'll make the, we, listen, when Noah built the ark, there was no rain. There was no, <laughs> there was no concern. There was not even a thunderstorm in the area. There was not a severe weather warning in the area when Noah started building the ark. But he built it. And then people began to look at it. Well, they found that the ark was, was necessary when it started to rain. 
Well, too late then because the doors are closed. Look, you got to make preparation while the opportunity presents itself. Why don't you please praise God one more time? Let the favor of the Lord be upon us. I'm speaking now. Let the favor of the Lord be on you. I'm speaking the favor of the Lord over your situation. Let the favor of God be upon you and establish the work of your hand. Whatever, you, whatever your plans are, whatever you're working on, allow, just listen, the favor of the Lord has to be allowed. Yeah, I mean, that's why when Jesus said in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He is saying that I have to be permitted to come in. God has to be allowed into your personal situation. You can block him out. You can do your own thing. But I want you to know that God is knocking at the door and he wants to apply favor to your situation. He wants to apply favor to your family, favor to your friends, favor over your enemies. I want you to know this. Everybody that's your enemy today they're not going to be your enemy tomorrow. Did you know that? There are people who are your enemies right now, but one day they're going to be your friend. Why? Because they're going to recognize how God is blessing you. And when they recognize how God is blessing you, then they're going to ask, what must I do to be saved? What must I do to be separated, to be sanctified, to be filled with? What must I do to be changed? Bless the name of Jesus. Well, one question. Do any of you have what I consider a but God testimony? Now what I mean when I say but God testimony, I mean that you realize that you could not have done this thing by yourself. And if God had not intervened, you would have been lost. How many of you have experienced a but God situation? But God. But God. We were dead in sin, but God. But God made us alive. See, he made, he made us, he took interest in you. Why? Because you are made in his likeness and in his image, he is extremely concerned about your ability to succeed, and he wants us to prosper. And so therefore, he intervenes. He protects us. Glory to God. He provides for us according to what? According to his riches. Last time I checked, there is no limit to God's riches. There's no limit to God's ability. Now let's get back to the scripture. In Acts chapter 7 and verse 9, I need you pay, to pay close attention to the words. It says, and the patriarchs became envious and sold Joseph into Egypt. But God, see, but God was with him. And you got to be very careful how you mess with people because you don't know if God is with them or not. <laughs> um, if you want to mess with somebody and then you find out that God is with them, now you done messed up. See? So they were, they, you know, I can in a way understand what happened to these patriarchs. And you got I'm bringing this out because you got some patriarchs in your family. You got some patriarchs, here's how I know. Because uh, I grew up in a family where somebody had to be the first person to graduate from a college. You see what I'm saying? All right, the patriarchs in that family are not always pulling for you to be that first one. Y'all ain't helping me with this. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And what they tell you is this. Child, you got a high school education. You better go and get a job. That's what you better do. 
We don't have no money to send you to college. How many of you heard that story before? All right. So what I'm telling you is if you heard that story, don't tell that story to your children. And so, and don't, don't position them to tell that story to their children. Because it's the patriarchs that affect your success. Look what they did in the case of, now, 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 now Joseph didn't help his case at all. Because his daddy made him a coat of many colors. And he was wearing that coat. I can imagine him wearing that coat around. And people were looking at him, asking questions. You know, what? who does he, you know. Y'all heard that before. And so it is, they're out in the field. And here he comes wearing that coat. And they're in the field. And where, where, where was he, you know. He's not in the field, but he came to the field. And you know how these young fellows, sometimes they can have an attitude. Came to the field looking around, and he told them, he said, look, guys, I had a dream, and you all were in it. <laughs> he said, but I was in charge. <laughs> he said, I was, y'all were bowing down to me. And they said, not so, <laughs> not so, <laughs> not so, not happening. So then they concocted a story that they were going to tell the daddy that an animal got a hold of him. But they decided, finally, to throw him in a pit. And then some merchants came along, took him, and that's what these guys do, they were slave traffickers. Yeah, that's what they did. And they took him and they sold him into slavery. You see, the patriarchs did this. All right, and I want you to know that you have to be very careful when you are in situations like that. A patriarch, I need to define a patriarch for you. A patriarch is a father, a ruler of a family, or a tribe, or the founder of something. The Hebrew families in the Bible included Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and all, listen, all of Jacob's 12 sons. So these gentlemen who threw Joseph in the pit, they were patriarchs. They were founders, if you will. They were leaders uh, in, in their environment. Amen. Now, let's, let's define envy. 